Welcome back and happy Monday. It is uh, Monday the 14th, <laughs> barely. And you may be wondering why this is lesson six instead of lesson five. We did lesson five in class. It was our suicide awareness training that we do every year uh, to kind of check in with everybody. And that one is not recorded so that we could just do that one live. But we're back with lesson six. And in this lesson, we're going to be um, talking about Monday and Tuesday. Uh, the 14th and 15th. We're going to be looking at the second standards assignment, which will be due next Saturday, the 26th. We're going to be doing a short overview of your literature assignment for this week, which is your weekly graded assignment on Gatsby. And then I'm going to be giving you some more information on the context of James Baldwin and William F. Buckley, who you've hopefully seen their debate by now that was assigned in the first week of September. And uh, we're going to continue on. So let's take a look at our learning targets for this week. Our first target for literature is reading chapter one of Gatsby and responding to some critical thinking questions using a Flipgrid assignment, which is posted in Google Classroom. That is a graded assignment this week, and it is posted in Google Classroom under the small assignments uh, class workspace. The second learning target is for your informational uh, lessons this week. And there is no graded assignment for those informational texts this week, but uh, your goal is to listen and record your thoughts and notes after learning about the context of Baldwin and Buckley's lives. So you should be taking notes. You'll be able to use those notes later on when we're working on our research papers. Your writing learning target is writing uh, a one, one to two theme statements for a short story or a video in your chosen career path or interest area, and including two cited quotes from that artifact that support your theme statements. That'll be standard assignment number two, and we'll be walking through that. And miscellaneous is still completing the A2C form, which we desperately need you to complete as soon as possible. If you complete it after Monday, we can't guarantee that you're gonna get credit for this course in JCTC. Um, I've been talking about this A2C form for weeks now, and if you haven't completed it, it's an important part of the class. All right, let's talk a little bit about the way that the week is structured. This is the beginning lesson. Uh, it's posted on Mondays for your Monday and Tuesday classes. It has a video and an assignment built in. That assignment is the Great Gatsby assignment that is due by Saturday, and the new standards assignment, which is due by next Saturday. You get two weeks on those to take your time and make sure that they represent your best work. My office hours will now be posted from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. I'll be posting a link to the Teams meeting room in Google Classroom. And then on Thursdays and Fridays, there will be a second lesson like this one that I'll post also to YouTube, Google Classroom, and um, I think we just said those two, two places. Take a moment for mindfulness. Here's a some chill ocean to vibe to. I don't have any stick bugs in this one. Uh, quick check-in, choose a GIF that represents best where your emotional state is. Take a moment to find yourself here. That's better in live class. All right, our second standards assignment is gonna be due next Saturday on the 26th. So there are 10 different ways for you to tackle that based on your career interest path. Um, you could do art, you could do poetry, you could do innovation or design, or um, we just added um, aviation to the innovation and design path um, this year. You can do gaming, you can do music, you can do journalism, you can do sports or medicine, you can do um, education or psychology, you can do military, military history or constitutional law, and you can also do um, authorship and writing. So this second standards assignment is all about finding and defending themes. So your goal is going to be to determine one to two themes or central ideas and analyze their development over the course of the text. So you'll be looking at, mostly you'll be looking at TED Talks in your career or interest path. Now, 
if you've been beaten to death with TED Talks, because a lot of teachers love to use TED Talks, I apologize. This this will be the TED Talk assignment for a while. Um, we won't lean on TED Talks super hard in this class. Um, you're going to be using a planning talk document to create two theme statements for a primary source video in your chosen career path, and then you're going to defend them by using a quote or just reasoning, um, and I'll give you examples of that. So the assignment itself in Google Classroom looks like this. Uh, this is kind of the planning document. So you are going to post, you're going to drop your chosen topic right in here. You'll give me a statement about your topic here, and then you'll add a qualifier statement here. Now to give you an example of what what that might look like, um, here is. If you look if you look down, I have an example for you. So I chose to use the Hunger Games as this example. So I said that the example topic is class warfare. So that's like, you know, um, when these people get mad at these people. <laughs> um, and so if my topic is class warfare, I'm going to expand that topic in my statement by saying the Hunger Games discusses the suffering caused by class warfare. So now all of a sudden this is a sentence. I've taken this topic and expanded it into a sentence. Um, and then we're going to also add, so that's great, that's good, um, but to get to great we're going to add a qualifier as well. So this qualifier is an additional thought that makes my sentence easier to defend as a as a claim. So the Hunger Games discusses the suffering caused by class warfare through the experience of lower class characters. Boom, and all of a sudden I have specific a specific concept to defend because I'm gonna be talking about, you know, PETA and Katniss. I, I I still can't get over the fact that the kid who bakes bread is named PETA. Okay. So when you're completing this assignment, you're going to be asked to drop your chosen source um, here. So whatever um, video you end up choosing, you'll pop, pop in there. Your first statement will go here, and then you'll have a supporting quote or explanation that goes here. And then if you do a second theme, I need one theme for full credit on this assignment, but if you do a second theme, you'll do the same thing down here. All right, so here's an example of completing the entire assignment using Hunger Games. You can't use the Hunger Games. You have to use one of the links that I provide you. So this won't count if you use the Hunger Games, but this is what it could look like. So my chosen source was the Hunger Games. And then similar to the last assignment, I'm going to give you some color-coded walkthroughs. So blue here is going to be the statement, green is going to be the topic, and yellow is going to be that qualifying clause or sentence enhancer. So back to that first example I gave you, the statement was the Hunger Games discusses the suffering caused by class warfare. And then my qualifying statement was through the experience of lower class characters like Katniss and PETA. So this is a supporting explanation instead of a supporting quote. So I'm going to use some, some argument here. I'm going to use a little bit of logic and I'm going to say that Katniss is from District 12, which is one of the poorest districts in the Hunger Games. The work of her and her family is stolen by the central districts who benefit from their work without any representation outside the annual Hunger Games. So that's a little bit of that class warfare. You have Katniss and her family just vibing down here. And you know, you have District 1 up here that benefits from all of their all of their work with none of their representation, which is very much class warfare. Um, the second statement that I decided to use was the Hunger Game explores family ties as a form of resistance to oppressive forces. So my t second topic is family ties and blown up a little bit as a form of resistance to oppressive forces. So family and then I make that into a sentence by adding the Hunger my you know my verb here the Hunger Games exploring this topic and then my sentence enhancer is they're using Katniss's actual family and the family she creates through those around her. So her legit personal close family, as well as the people that she kind of like gloms onto as the story goes on. So my quote is, 
when Katniss says she can't go home because her home would die with Peta if he died, she says, you're not leaving me, me here alone, I say, because if he dies, I'll never go home. Not really. I'll spend the rest of my life in this arena trying to think my way out. So Katniss is basically saying, like, I can't really go home without him because he is my home because young adult love story. Oh. So um, that's the <laughs> that's the um, that's my example of. Uh, her finding her family. So she's kind of created a family and the people that she runs into in the Hunger Games. So what you need to take away from this when you're putting yours together is um, you have your topic and if you can identify your topic or the topic of the talk that you're watching, that's a great place to start. After you identify the topic, then you can put together a statement. And after you put together a statement, then you can qualify that statement and add some sentence enhancers. A little bit more on thematic statements, a little bit more background um, if you're still trying to uh, figure out how to find these. So a thematic statement summarizes the theme of a work. It's similar to a thesis statement. Uh, most short works like stories and poems have one or two themes. Longer works like novels and plays usually have a whole bunch. Gatsby has a whole bunch. However, an author almost never states the theme directly. Readers usually figure them out um, through subtext, not direct text. A theme is a meaning of the work. It's, it's trying to tell me that this is wrong, but it is a meaning, not the only meaning. Um, can the theme just be love or hate or greed? No, that's just a topic. So if you think that it's talking about love or hate or greed, that's great, you found the topic. The theme is going to be bigger than that. Um, the theme is the statement the author is making about a topic. So if you say Romeo and Juliet is about love, that's not quite true. Shakespeare's certainly writing about love. You could say that Romeo and Juliet is about how the love between two 14-year-olds in Verona is doomed to end in their murder-suicides. That'd be, that'd be closer to a theme statement. <laughs> And for each of your theme statements in this assignment, you're going to need a topic, a statement, and a qualifier. So back in the uh, previous um, slides, the topic was was green, the statement was bl was blue, and your qualifier was yellow. If you're looking at the uh, slides with the colors on them, and you're also going to need a quote or an explanation that supports your statement from the text or video. And that's the end of our writing lesson. So let's talk a little bit about the reading assignment this week for The Great Gatsby. So I have posted chapter one of The Great Gatsby, either guided reading with me, or you can read it on your own. Either way is fine. Um, however, you're more comfortable reading that, you can read it you can listen to me read it and discuss it, or you can read it on your own just through the slides. Or if you have the, if you own the book, that's cool too. You could buy the book. You don't have to buy the book to read it. Um, so we won't always have assignments attached to the guided reading. We do have an assignment this week. Um, real quick reminder that all the blue words when you're reading those slides are aligned to ACT reading questions and the red words are aligned to the vocabulary you need for the ACT English. And some of the look fors that we're looking at in chapter one is who has money, where does that money come from, how do people live who are wealthy, how do people live who are poor, and what is F. Scott Fitzgerald saying about these topics with his characters. So your responsibility this week is to read that first chapter in Gatsby or listen to me read it, which is totally fine too. Um, I might do that if I were you because you can speed me up by increasing the speed on YouTube. So it'll take, if you knock it up to 2.00, 2 right, it have, go, moves in half the time. So it takes half the time to read it. And uh, if you can understand it at that speed, then you can read it in half the time. The reading is posted in Google Classroom under primary texts. And there is a journaling assignment. So those readings are posted separately from this lesson. I'm not going to read during this lesson like that uh, from chapter one. We are going to spend more time during this lesson talking about the context of Baldwin and 
All right, so the journal assignment this week is after reading chapter one uh, or listening to it, respond to one of the following questions in the shared Flipgrid assignment in Google Classroom. If you do not want to use Flipgrid, you can just post your response to the comments on that Google Classroom assignment. So the four different possible journal responses, and you could do more than one of these if you're feeling like you want more interaction with, with me or if you want to get more um, feedback on your writing or your thoughts or you just want to get more out of this English class, you can respond to more than one of these. But I would I need one of these for credit. Um, why do you think Daisy stays with Tom? What do you think Nick means when he says Gatsby has an extraordinary capacity for hope? Tom is racist. That's a statement, not a question. <laughs> How did the actions of the characters around Tom allow for his racism to go unchallenged? And what is your opinion of the text so far? And if you do respond to the last one, make sure you give me three to four sentences because that one's just an opinion question and it's less tied to the specific events of the chapter. So I'll need a little bit more to know that you are reading and that you are kind of considering what you're reading. And that is the graded assignment for this week. It is due complete by Saturday, and that is the end of the literature lesson. It's a quick literature lesson today because we're going to spend more time talking about Baldwin versus Buckley. So we're going to get some more background on both men here. This is not a graded assignment. i just like to give you more context on those two men and their histories. And uh, be sure to finish the Padlet from two weeks ago if you haven't. I'll still take that. Um, there's a number of people who haven't completed it. There's a number of people who responded anonymously and haven't posted what their response was in Google Classroom. Again, if you respond anonymously to the Padlet, I don't know who you are to give you credit. So you need to post your Padlet response in Google Classroom also. It's easier if you can just respond not anonymously to the Padlet, but if you'd rather post anonymously, I understand, because this is a an intense topic. And if you're concerned about, I don't know, getting blowback for having opinions, that's cool. I still need to know who you are in Google Classroom so I can give you credit for your work. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, the context of James Baldwin, uh, who you hopefully heard debate a couple weeks ago with William Buckley. So Baldwin was born on August 2nd, 1924, to Emma Burgess Jones, who left Baldwin's biological father because of his drug abuse. She moved to Harlem, where Baldwin was born in Harlem Hospital. And that's um, uh, Harlem uh, in New York City. In New York, Jones married a Baptist preacher, David Baldwin, with whom she had eight children, born between 1927 and 1943. Her husband also had a son from a previous marriage who was nine years older than James. So Baldwin, like Malcolm X, came from a very large family. And like Malcolm X, their family was poor, and Baldwin's stepfather, whom in essays he referred to as his father, treated him more harshly than his other children. Baldwin's intelligence combined with the persecution he endured in his stepfather's home drove him to spend much of his time alone in libraries. So he kind of found refuge in books from an early age. By the time he reached adolescence, he discovered his passion for writing. His educators deemed him gifted, and in 1937, at the age of 13, he wrote his first article, titled Harlem, Then and Now, which was published in his school's magazine, The Douglas Pilot. He spent much of his time caring for his several younger brothers and sisters, and at the age of 10, he was teased and abused by two New York police officers, an instance of racist harassment by the NYPD that he would experience again as a teenager and document in his essays. His stepfather died of tuberculosis in the summer of 1943 on the day his last child was born, just before Baldwin turned 19. Not only would the day of the funeral be Baldwin's 19th birthday, it would also be that of the Harlem riot of 1943 an event portrayed in the beginning of his Notes of a Native Son essay. Okay, so that's a lot. So his dad, is, his stepfather has just died of tuberculosis right before he turns 19. And on the day of his 19th birthday, the Harlem riot of 1943 happens. On that riot, um, uh, from the article on that riot, I have a little blurb at the bottom. The underlying causes of the riot stem from resentment among black residents of Harlem of the disparity between the vaunted values of American democracy and the social and economic conditions they were forced to live under, including brutality and discriminatory treatment by the mostly white city police force. Sounds familiar. Um, one of the reasons we're reading about Baldwin and Buckley is because a lot of their experiences in, in, in their lives and the, basically the foundational beliefs that they have and that they talk about in the debate 
mirror the Black Lives Matter and the quote unquote back the blue movement today. Oh, a little bit more information on Baldwin's stepfather. So Baldwin's stepfather was a preacher and Baldwin, much like Malcolm X, saw his stepfather's faith as a sort of a trap that kept him from being radicalized. Like he had a lot of, he found a lot of hope in his faith while at the same time being really depressed by being a, a, a black man living in the American North where he thought he would be able to provide for his family but Baldwin writes about how his father was a deeply depressed man because other than his faith, because he could not um, ever rise through the ranks of white society and become like independently wealthy. He felt that there was a ceiling above him at all times. So in 1953, Baldwin's first novel, Go Tell It on a Mountain, which was a semi-autobiographical buildings Roman which is a great word that just means like a coming of age story where like the main character grows up. His first collection of essays, Notes of a Native Son, appeared two years later. He continued to experiment with literary forms throughout his career, publishing poetry and plays, as well as the fiction and essays for which he was known. Baldwin's probably most famous for being an essayist um, or for writing um, The Fire Next Time and Go Tell It on the Mountain. Speaking of The Fire Next Time, his lengthy essay, Down at the Cross, which is usually called The Fire Next Time because it was in a book by the same name, showed the seething discontent of the 1960s in novel form. The essay was originally published in two oversized issues of The New Yorker and landed Baldwin on the cover of Time magazine in 1963, just a couple years before he debated Buckley. While he was touring the South, speaking about the rest of civil, well, the, uh, so speaking about the civil rights movement, Around the time of publication of The Fire Next Time, Baldwin became a known spokesperson for civil rights and a celebrity noted for championing the cause of black Americans. He frequently appeared on television and delivered speeches on college campuses. The essay talking about the uneasy relationship between Christianity and the burgeoning black Muslim movement. After publication, several black nationalists criticized Baldwin for his conciliatory attitude. They questioned whether his message of love and understanding would do much to change race relations in America. The book was consumed by whites looking for answers to the question, what do black Americans really want? Baldwin's essays never stopped articulating the anger and frustration felt by real life black Americans with more clarity and style than any other writer of his generation. I think that he was super clear. I've been listening to the autobiography of Malcolm X that just came out on Audible. It was read by Lawrence Fishburne, the dude who played Morpheus uh, in The Matrix, and he does a great job. And there's this really wonderful, like, commonality between Baldwin's writing and Malcolm X's writing and that they're both really disgusted with right with the civil rights movement in that it feels the need to make white people comfortable with the idea of civil rights whereas like uh you know Malcolm X demanded civil rights where a lot of MLK's rhetoric isn't so much a demand as a request for civil rights and to be considered in, in, in Baldwin and Malcolm's eyes. And they don't want to request, they want to demand or the very, or even like um, uh, just recognize that there are civil rights. Now it's a really, it's a really interesting dichotomy between the Baldwin, Malcolm and MLK parts of the movement. And we're seeing a lot of that debate today and whether or not whether or not rioting is is acceptable as a form of civil rights expression or is an expression of uh, civil rights. So on the Baldwin's death, um, Toni Morrison, who wrote Beloved, eulogized Baldwin, and she said at his eulogy, you knew, didn't you, how I needed your language and the mind that formed it, how I relied on your fierce courage to tame wildernesses for me. How strengthened I was by the certainty that came from knowing that you would never hurt me. You knew, didn't you, how I loved your love. You knew. This then is no calamity. No, this is jubilee. Our crown, you said, has already been bought and paid for. All we have to do, you said, is wear it. So Baldwin's legacy um, is, he, you know, he's, he's being brought up a lot right now as a civil rights writer who spoke to the complexity of race in America, and he didn't simplify. Now, what we mean by that is 
when we talk about Baldwin um, uh, presenting the complicated view of race in America is how um, racism has harmed not only black Americans, but, but how race, racism has harmed all Americans. And uh, that has been, you know, you know, that's complicated. That's a complicated um, uh, way to look at race. And it's not generally taught alongside Martin Luther King um, because the people who write the history books are generally white and they find Martin Luther King less threatening than Baldwin and Malcolm X. So they present the less threatening civil rights leaders. Um, here's a good quote from Raoul Peck, who says, I think when you're younger and you're trying to find answers, I don't think Baldwin is the person you go to. I think when you recognize and you become aware of the complexity of the problem, then you want to go to someone who articulates the complexity and is prepared to rest with ambiguity. And then for Peck, Baldwin hasn't been so much out of fashion as a constant unsighted influence. 10 or 12 years ago, I said it was time to go back to him because he had somehow, because he had become somehow forgotten. So I think that Baldwin's really valuable, valuable right now, as is Malcolm X, for understanding where we're at. Um, not that Martin Luther King should in any way be diminished for the, uh, what he did with civil rights, but it's important to recognize that the reason that Martin Luther King is taught in history classes over Baldwin and Malcolm X is because he's the less um, uh, threatening um, civil rights speaker. All right, moving on to William F. Buckley and his context. It's going to be a little different. So Buckley was born in, on November 24th in 1925 in New York City, the son of Aloise Josephine Antonia and William Frank Buckley, a Texas-born lawyer and oil developer. His mother from New Orleans was of Swiss, German, German, and Irish descent, while his paternal grandparents were from Hamilton, Ontario, and Canada, who were also of Irish ancestry. So he's mostly an Irish kid. The six of ten children, Buckley, which is interesting because Buckley and Baldwin both came from large families. Uh, Buckley moved as a boy with his family to Mexico and then to Sharon, Connecticut, before beginning his formal schooling in Paris, where he attended first grade. By age seven, he received his formal training in English at a day school in London. His first and second languages were Spanish and French. As a boy, Buckley developed a love for music, sailing, horses, hunting, and skiing, all interests reflected in his later writings. He was homeschooled through the eighth grade using the Calvert School of Baltimore's homeschool curriculum. Just before World War II, at age 12 to 13, he attended the Jesuit Preparatory School at St. John's Beaumont in England. Um, and that's a picture of the school he went to as a 12 year old in England. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty different childhood. This is an extremely wealthy, you know, European globe trotting childhood. Buckley served stateside in the United States Army during the Second World War before attending Yale University, where he mastered debate and engaged in conservative political commentary. Serving stateside means not being deployed. Afterward, he worked for two years in the Central Intelligence Agency, that's the CIA. In addition to editorials in the National Review, Buckley wrote God and Man at Yale, a book, and more than 50 other books on diverse topics, including writing, speaking, history, politics, and sailing. His works included a series of novels featuring fictitious CIA agent Blackford Oaks, as well as a nationally syndicated newspaper column. Buckley called himself either a libertarian or a conservative, and George H. Nash, a historian of the American modern conservative movement, said in 2008 that Buckley was arguably the most important public intellectual in the United States in the past half century. For an entire generation, he was the preeminent voice of American conservatism in its first great ecumenical figure, meaning this, is, this guy is a foundational speaker and thinker for American conservatism. Buckley's primary contribution to politics was a fusion of traditionalist conservatism and classical liberalism, which laid the groundwork for the rightward shift of the Republican Party, exemplified by Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan. So some things that he wrote. In 1954, Buckley and his brother-in-law, Elbert Bozell Jr., co-authored a book called McCarthy and His Enemies. Bozell worked with Buckley at the American Mercury in the early 1950s when it was edited by William Bradford Huey, the book strongly defended Senator Joseph McCarthy as a patriotic crusader against communism. The book asserted that McCarthyism is a movement around which men of goodwill and stern morality can close ranks. 
Buckley edited the American Mercury in 1951 and 1952, but left after perceiving newly emerging anti-Semitic tendencies in the magazine. Buckley and his editors used National Review to define the boundaries of conservatism and to exclude people, ideas or groups they considered unworthy of the conservative title. For example, Buckley denounced Ayn Rand, the John Birch Society, George Wallace, racists, white supremacists, and anti-Semites. So Buckley was an important part of determining what American conservatism was and what it was not. He helped build the edges of American conservatism. He put inside of that belief system McCarthy and the Red Scare, and he put outside of that belief system formally white supremacist racism and um, Ayn Rand's um, libertarianism. He was also uh, fairly famous for, he's also really famous in America for this program called Firing Line, which you may or may not have ever heard of because it ended before any of you were born. Although the program's format varied over the years, it typically featured Buckley interviewing and exchanging views with a guest while seated together in front of a small studio audience. Standing or sitting further away in the studio, an examiner, typically a liberal, would ask questions, generally toward the end of, show, end of the show. Most guests were intellectuals or those in positions of power, being notable in the fields of politics, religion, literature, and academia. Their views would could either sharply contrast or be in strong agreement with Buckley. So usually pretty good debates. So as of his death, here's how people responded. Notable members of the Republican political establishment paid tribute to Buckley included George W. Bush, former Speaker of the House of Representatives Newt Gingrich, and former First Lady Nancy Reagan. Bush said of Buckley, he influenced a lot of people, including me. He captured the imagination of a lot of people. Gingrich said, Bill Buckley became the indispensable intellectual advocate from whose energy, intelligence, wit, and enthusiasm the best of modern conservatism drew its inspiration and encouragement. Buckley began what led to Senator Barry Goldwater and his conscience of a conservative that led to the seizing of power by the conservatives from the moderate establishment within the Republican Party. From that emerged Ronald Reagan. Reagan's widow Nancy commented, Ronnie valued Bill's counsel through, throughout his political life, and after Ronnie died, Bill and Pat were there for me in so many ways. So Buckley really is the father of modern conservative, conservative thinking, and he was also the father of modern conservative talk shows and talk show hosts. Um, his legacy, and in a 2008 article, a commenter said that his rhetorical style is part of his legacy, and conservatives have often tried to emulate it. It's this gladiatorial style, as Lee calls it, that's flashy and combative, filled with sound bites, and leads to an inflammatory drama. As conservatives encounter Buckley's arguments about government, liberalism, and markets, the theatrical appeal of Buckley's gladiatorial style inspired conservative imitators becoming one of the principal templates for conservative rhetoric. So when you listen to a conservative talk show host and the way that they speak, they're all kind of similar in their speech patterns and in their debate patterns. That similarity can be traced back to William Buckley and the way that he ran his talk show on Firing Line and the way that he wrote for the National Review. Um, it's kind of built into the DNA of modern conservatism in a similar way that um, James Baldwin's critique, his, his living critique of American um, uh, politics and uh, the fabric of American of race in America is baked into Black Lives Matter. All right, so that's some context for Buckley and Baldwin, and I hope that I didn't um, uh, bore your ears off. That's uh, that to me is really fascinating because it provides some context for the foundation of where we're at right now, narratively as a country. Um, we're going to talk more about that. We're going to look at some more foundational documents in our next lesson that's going to post on Thursday and Friday. And on Thursday and Friday, we're going to have less of me reading and a couple of videos, and we're going to have um, more focus on our primary documents. A couple of questions for you to grow on. Um, how do the differences between Baldwin and Buckley's early lives produce their philosophies? Um, maybe choose one man. What's the impact of their legacy on American discourse and discussion? And if you could ask one question of either man, what would that question be? And why would you want to ask that question? Uh, for me, I'd have questions for both those dudes. Honestly, I'd like to sit in a room and listen to them talk longer. Uh, real quick reminder, here's where we're at work-wise. Your old assignments are the discussion on Padlet, which was due on the 5th. 
you needed to have that A2C form turned in as of the 4th. Your st first standards assignment was due last weekend, and you have two new current assignments. You have the Gatsby Chapter 1 response, which is due by this Saturday, and you have the second standard assignment for on themes, which is due by next Saturday. And a quick note, all assignments are now marked with the word graded in Google Classroom to make it easier for you to see what you need to complete to pass this class. So be on that lookout for that graded word in Google Classroom. That means that that is something that will go in the gradebook and you will need to complete to pass the course. Um, I hope you guys have a good day and I hope to see you in class. Bye.